Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us for uh, the May 2023 CLE. That was hard to say. Um, for Hyla Lunchtime CLE. Um, we're joined today by uh, Julian Brackman, um, who is going to talk to us about um, employment. Um, so Mr. Brackman began his legal career as a solo attorney in the Greenway Plaza area of Houston. Um, and he continues his general civil practice the heavy focus on federal labor and employment law. Um, and in the last 10 years of his practice, Julian has represented both employees and employers, including the Royal Consulate General of Saudi Arabia, an international oil and gas metadata firm, and several local businesses. Uh, when he is not running his legal practice, Julian helps run his family's cattle ranch in Brenham, Texas, or volunteers for his preferred charitable organization. Um, so we're very much looking forward to hearing from him today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. I will put the course number for the CLE in the chat. Um, please self-report your CLE um, on you know, the State Bar of Texas website. Um, and also please, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, but we will address them at the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please shoot me an email or send me a message in the chat. Thank you so much. I'll let Julian take it away. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, when I was approached to speak, um, the prompt was somewhat amorphous. Um, part of it was about having a practice after your first five years. And the other part was, of course, about employment law. So I've divided this into two parts, each 30 minutes. The first part will be more internal. The second part will focus highly on employment law, but I've tried to keep things as well-rounded as I can, given the duration of my practice and the nature of my experience. Um, first and foremost, I've been a solo since the word go. I was a paralegal before I went to law school. Um, during summer breaks between law school semesters, and then once I graduated, I hung up my own shingle immediately. Um, to say that it's been a trial by fire would be uh, quite generous. Um, but to that end, I just wanted to walk through 30 points, which I think are highly relevant um, as far as internal reflections and self-management for younger attorneys. Um, first, take advantage of state bar benefits, especially insurance programs. They are there and provided specifically for us. And it's not just you know your accidental death and dismemberment. They actually have a, quite a robust life insurance policy, and I promise this is not uh, uh, sponsored. Um, second, set achievable goals and metrics constantly and revisit them. Um, at the start of each year, I set aside time to lay out goals and desired outcomes. Uh, you want to do this both personally and as a lawyer, and most importantly, as a business, because ultimately, if you have a solo practice, or if even if you've joined a smaller firm or are starting a smaller firm, you need to be business minded. And that's one course that they never teach us in law school. Um, set your metrics and track them. Do this monthly and quarterly. And if you have guideposts, it will help you really see how you're doing and let you recognize whether or not you're adhering to them and allow you to track your own performance. It shows where you're strong and where you're weak. And you can either play to your strengths or you can try to bolster your weaknesses and set yourself up for long-term benefit. Because once you set goals each year, you get in the habit of doing that. And you can you know, remonstrate yourself for not achieving what you have, but you can also see what you have done and perhaps where you need to shore up or double down on certain other things. Um, point number three, hire competent staff as soon as possible. And these may not even be paralegals or law school students. Um, my office manager is a former ICE officer and a certified private investigator for the state of Texas. She has a degree in psychology and a uh, degree in criminal justice. Don't be afraid to invest in your staff, whether it's some type of continued education, some type of certification, uh, notary license. These are things that will pay for themselves. And honestly, there are some aspects of my practice that would not be successful if I didn't have a notary in my office. 
It's difficult to find one on a day-to-day -day basis. It's impossible to find one after hours when you'll find yourself closing most of your cases. Um, number four, allow for in-depth intake of a client before you sign them up. Never be too in love with a potential case. Before you send over your contract, allow yourself time to look at every angle and ask yourself what you're missing. What are you not seeing here? If it looks too good to be true, it may very well be. Um, if your client refuses to consolidate their documents, their proof, their evidence, and delays sending you these vital items for you to review before you send your contract, something is wrong. Why are they trying to hide the ball from you? That's a good question to ask. I would say if and when you get staff, train them to sniff out bad cases. Because for every one good case, there are a dozen cases out there that are not preferential. Um, be comfortable with turning cases away. I recall when I was, I think, a second year in my legal writing course, a visiting lawyer came and she indicated that she had a 95% turnaway rate. And when I sat in my chair, I didn't have the um, attitude to say this out loud, but I thought, that's insane. You're losing money. How can you do that? Having practiced now for a decade, I can verify a 95% turnaway rate is extremely healthy. Um, be comfortable with turning cases away and focusing on cases that you want and cases that are good. And there is a bit of a triumvirate when it comes to that. You'll have, a case, you'll have subjects that you're good at, subjects that you like, and subjects that pay well. And of the three, you usually get to pick one or two. Think about that. Um, item five, your power of attorney and contract should be replete with addendums and provisions that cover you. Uh, an attorney would be prudent to have indemnification language throughout their employment contract. Any engagement needs to cover you more than the client. And if that's not your mindset, I suggest you alter it immediately. You need to have language regarding communication protocols, when your client can and cannot reach out to you. You need to have provisions that talk about their silence on social media that restrict them from publishing, especially in this day and age. Any platform, known or unknown, neutralized. Um, I would say that you need to have language in there that reminds your client that they have a duty to preserve evidence, documents, and electronics. You need to have robust provisions that indicate what allow you to withdraw without notice or even with notice to withdraw and retain your interest or withdraw for cause or where it's unsustainable. Maybe there's a, a, a recently decided Supreme Court case that says, I can no longer represent you for these matters. Um, I would absolutely include indemnification under House Bill 300, which talks about the transmittal of sensitive health information in the service of assisting a client or performing legal services. In case there's a catastrophic data breach, you need to be held harmless. You don't know how that's gonna happen. You could, I don't know if you have a fax machine, you could be faxing their information to opposing. You could receive a fax from the doctor's office. You could be hacked. Someone could break into your office and steal your hard drives. Whatever the case may be, you should be indemnified from any type of catastrophic data breach that contains their proprietary, personal, and private health information. Finally, I would suggest a binding arbitration provision in your contracts. There's no sense in having a dissatisfied client put their laundry out in the open for all and sundry. Doesn't make sense. And I personally don't think it's healthy. Not that I've ever had to deal with it. Um, item six, take advantage of social media advertising, but avoid it otherwise. Uh, Facebook will be a robust source of referrals from attorneys that know and trust you. They've either seen your work product, they've worked alongside you, you've spoken to them. In some cases, you've been across the table from them. Use Facebook or Instagram or whatever your preferred social media is to your advantage to further your business. Because make no mistake, when you're on social media, your business foot steps forward first. As a lawyer, especially with any kind of 
firm, be it medium or large size, your actions reflect back on that entity, on that institution. And so, and, and even if you are a solo, your actions reflect on your reputation. So if you act accordingly in public, great, fine. But social media, everybody kind of loses that sense of reality. You can be what they call a keyboard warrior. Don't do that. Post about work, post something funny, keep it light on the personal stuff. You do not need to overshare on social media. What you do need to share are your accomplishments, your certifications, um, you know, good news on a case, robust settlements, basically bragging rights. There's the whole artificial reality. Everyone only shows what's going on and what's best in their world on Facebook. Let that, let that leave you. There's no reason to overshare on social media. Uh, item seven, network four times more outside your circle than within it. It's extremely easy to only network with lawyers. We all have the same problems. We go to the same bars. We go to the same clubs. We have the same friends. It's too easy to not get outside of your comfort zone and go network with engineers, with product analysts, sales, services, medicine. Areas outside of law are where you get your clients. By all means, continue networking with your colleagues. That makes absolute sense, but you have to level up. If, you, if you're a young attorney, if you're a solo or you run or have a small firm, you absolutely have to network in other circles, whether it's golfing, jujitsu, um, you know, your neighborhood soccer league, get out at trivia at the local pub. As long as you are out among people, it will serve you. I uh, volunteered with the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo for a decade. And I only stopped right before COVID because my schedule kind of went to pot. But once you establish those connections and you network with those people and you even volunteering serve alongside them, like I did with the rodeo, to this day, I still have people from the rodeo reaching out to me, asking me for consultations, for referrals, for helping, you know, any, any kind of service they need. They just know that I'm a lawyer. And being able to say, well, I can't help you, but I can refer you to a friend of mine, that's just as good as saying, yes, I'll take your case. Um, number eight, champion at least two charities that you believe in. Um, I'm not going to advertise any charity over any other. Whatever cause suits you, whatever thing you like, I'll drop my two, which is the Houston Rodeo and Sky High for Kids, which supports pediatric cancer. Um, whatever you choose, that's going to, that, and that relates back to, of course, item seven with networking. Whatever you choose, it will serve as an entree for you to network with other people that aren't attorneys. There is nothing that gives you that kind of presence and entrance better than not only networking with these people, but networking through a volunteer system that actually serves the community and gives back to it. And ultimately, that's our industry. We are, we are a service industry here to help the masses, to help people that cannot otherwise help themselves. So to me, that just makes sense. Uh, number nine, take up a group sport that requires interaction. Um, this can be, you know, a, a soccer, flag football, um, <laughs> CrossFit, all of those things foster group interactivity. Too often, lawyers spend most of their day, just like I am right here and just like you are, face forward into a screen all day long. That is not healthy. That's not how the human brain was meant to operate. You need to interact with people and not just people who are approaching you with problems all the time like our clients are. I have never had a client call me up and say, hey, Julian, let's go grab lunch. By the way, I won the lottery. Uh, you know, where should I go for vacation? Let's talk. Let's, you know, have you had, have you read any good books lately? That doesn't happen. People approach us with bad news. Go interact with other people outside, away from law. Touch grass, free air. Uh, item 10, give yourself nights and weekends as often as possible. There is no client, there is no case that will give you back that time or justify the loss of that time. Unless, and this is my big caveat, unless you have some type of looming deadline. And of course, if you miss it, you bungle the case and you know 
everything goes down down the drain. That's bad. Otherwise, give yourself nights and weekends off as much as possible. My first five years, I would work. I would find myself working until 2 a.m. And I'd get up at 6 or 7 and do it all over again. Why I did that, I don't know. Um, it definitely helped to bolster all of my research, all of my pleadings. But there was a very long time where I missed things. And I regret that. Um, item 11, don't be afraid to shoulder your clients with homework. There are, of course, items that your client can deal with, especially discovery. They're not going to do it right, but feel free to task them with providing other documents. Getting everything together. They need, and there are too many cases, and, and we'll revisit this in a moment. There are too many cases where the judge wants discovery up front, documents, relevant evidence, calendars, notes, emails, and texts. Have your client do that. You should not have to pull teeth to get that from your client. They should actually come to you with, ideally, a binder in hand that has all of these items. Um, item 12, don't be afraid to bill for your time and effort. A lot of us undervalue ourselves. In our first five, seven years, we really have to kind of get a grasp on what our, what our hours are really worth. Um, once you reach a certain amount of time and a certain amount of skill, you are worth it. And you do not question that. And I have found that when I tell my clients what the fee structure will be up front and they have no qualms and they are comfortable with paying for my time, the case actually goes better. They're more compliant. They're interested. They have skin in the game versus clients where I cut them a deal or I take pity on them or whatever it is, those are usually more difficult clients. The only variant I would say would be pro bono clients where they're absolutely thrilled that you're taking care of them. Um, I always take at least one pro bono client per quarter. Um, and as far as employment law, I'm an ad litem 99% of my ad litem work is pro bono. I just feel like that should, you know, not to not to chip into a uh, council that only does estate and probate work, but whatever you can do to help, I feel like should be should be fair. Uh, item 13, take care of your referring attorneys and their staff, especially the staff. They're the ones that make things happen. Um, I, around the Christmas times um, or Thanksgiving, I will send a, and feel free to steal this idea, but don't judge me for it. I send a cooler of meat from a butcher that's pretty near to my family's cattle ranch. It's not our cows, but it's a cooler and it's same day shipping. And everyone loves sausage and tamales and steaks and all that. And I find that that works. People appreciate that. Um, to that end, I also sponsor a cook-off tent for the Houston barbecue uh, right before the rodeo. I will take my referring attorneys there. And of course, everyone loves alcohol and meat. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great combination. You're not going to go wrong. Um, item 14, confront prob problematic clients and do not be afraid to cut them loose. Um, you need to lay down the law with certain clients and enforce your boundaries. Without that, they'll walk all, you, well, all over you and have no recourse for it. Item 15, if you haven't done this already, get admitted to every federal district immediately. North, south, east, and west. Um, once you are fully admitted, you will not have to worry about finding friendly counsel or filing pro hoc vice. Um, because that's an extra hundred dollars on your filing fees that you could spare yourself or your client, depending on your fee structure. Um, I would say that 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 also helps you get an understanding of what it means to bring a case in each federal district. You'll get a feel for how the judges are and how the court staff works. And believe me, they're they're different all over. I don't know why it's not unified, but it's not for me to judge. Item 16, 
figure out the difference between what you like and what you're good at. Um, I'll leave that at that. Uh, item 17, take time at least twice a month to be with non-lawyer friends. You don't want to talk shop all the time, especially on your off time. Uh, item 18, know your reputation is attached to everything you do. Uh, 19, make new friends and find like-minded people who will talk about the world, not just work. You see how all these are kind of bleeding together, little, little circling back there. Um, Self-working, uh, item 20, self-advertising and networking are your first hobbies. They should take precedence before others. Um, until you have a built-up firm where you have, say, an office manager or an individual who's in charge of marketing, or better yet, an outsourced firm, you are in charge of marketing. And I suggest you take it, you can take it seriously or cavalierly as long as you take it on head first. Um, I post a good amount of memes in my um, in my Facebook groups, employment law groups, whatever. Um, but I also will talk with my friendly counsel and you know ask them if they want to go grab a beer or something. And you know if you're working past three o'clock on a Friday with no deadlines, I think that's a good time. Um, Twenty one jack of all trades, master of none but still better than a master of one. Be diverse. Have the flexibility to handle certain things. Even I still bill myself as having a general civil practice. In truth, more than 95% of my cases are employment law, but I still deal with occasional BGPA, personal injury, or estate issues. Um, and of course, while you wait, for all of your cases to come to fruition, even if they have a rolling admission, um, even if you have mediations every month for the first quarter of the year, you still need something to fill in the cracks. And for me, smaller cases are the popcorn that I can have between my stakes. Um, item 22, bend the knee to your own ambition and nothing else. It should always grow. If you're a younger attorney, and you mean to have your own office or start a smaller office with friends or even be part of a, a medium-sized firm, your ambition is going to play into this. And I'd say if you're a solo, you should allow your ambition to go beyond your legal practice. Um, I myself have several side businesses beyond the, the cattle ranch. And I, I run and operate my family's cattle ranch and have done so for the last um, six or seven years, I think. Um, it's an adventure, but it keeps you sharp and it keeps you hungry. And I think that's a very important part of a younger attorney is to stay hungry. It's very easy to become complacent, to be comfortable, to have the entire setup that's offered to you that, you know, all these cases will continue to feed you. But that's not going to satisfy you. Um, an excellent criminal defense attorney that I know, he spends his weekends woodworking. The man can build a cabinet, entertainment system, a bed, rocking chairs. It's quite impressive. Um, I don't have a link for him. I don't know if he sells anything, but his entire garage is basically a woodworking shop. Um, I would say find something that allows you to keep feeding your ambition. The story doesn't end just because you passed the bar. This is, it's just, it's just a start. Um, item 23, set strict time windows for yourself and follow them or your work will consume you. Um, I think that speaks for itself. 24, be envious of the person you have the potential to become and no one else. You're not in a race against anyone except for yourself. So yeah, you can look on Facebook and see that other people are doing better, maybe other people are doing worse. Disregard that. You only need to work on yourself and your business and how you're doing. I guarantee you, if you start looking at other people's progress, if you don't feel, have some type of uh, inflated sense of self-accomplishment, then on the other end of the spectrum, you may feel even worse. That's not worth it. Um, item 25, invest in yourself constantly, whether it's trial college, bar college, board certification, um, getting a notary license. Um, 
I think I, what was it? I got um, Bar College because I'm a nerd and I love CLE. Uh, but I'm also, um, what is it? Uh, 40 under 40 national trial lawyers. I think they did that just based on the sheer volume of live seats that I have at any given time. Um, item 26, schedule your work so you can be asleep by 1030 and up by 630. Whatever variance it takes to give yourself seven or eight hours of sleep. Um, if you don't get enough sleep, you're not going to have a good time. Um, item 27, don't forget to include self-study in your CLE hours. Every year you can report, I think it's between, oh gosh, uh, three and five hours of self-study. Um, I would highly recommend you do that because there are some cases you're going to have where you do have to self-study. You have to do the research. Um, and we'll get back to the research in a minute. Uh, item 28, find a mechanism to help you blow off steam, whether it's the gym or any of those group sports I discussed earlier, um, or even a hobby like um, woodworking, right? Uh, item 29, work outside as often as possible. There's literally nothing stopping us now that we can work remote from setting up a desk, a screen, and a camera going to town. Um, sunlight is very nice and that sounds silly but i guarantee you if you work outside when the weather's nice obviously not today you'll enjoy it um item 30 that's the last one from here consider standing desks or ergonomic seating devices and that brings to a conclusion the internal reflections for younger solo attorneys and i'm going to shift gears now 12 30 on the mark very nice <clears throat> to a beginner's guide to employment law. Okay. And what I may very well do to keep everyone entertained is switch to some memes, which I think I put here somewhere. Um, Let's see if this is it. Okay. All right. Can everyone see that? Are you familiar with this document? <laughs> okay. Um, so in your first five years, um, I would, well, after your first five years, honestly, as early as your first year, I would develop a dossier on all of your judges, your opposings. Um, know where everyone went to undergrad, where they went to law school, if it can be helped, their preferred sports teams or activities or charities or vacation destinations. Go to bar functions, whether it's Houston or state bar, bench lectures, dinners, award galas. This gives you instant access into congenial conversation with these people that has nothing to do with the work or the cases you may have. More than anything, judges love to talk about not work. Once you develop this connection, when you approach the judge with a hitch or a problem in your case, especially as the party offering a solution instead of the one complaining about a problem, that judge will be more apt to listen to you. Strive to be friendly or at least neutral with your counterparts. The mark of a cool, detached attorney is the ability to be congenial with opposing counsel before and after you basically have to fight each other. Um, I believe it was Mike Tyson who said, not everyone who fights you is your enemy and not everyone who helps you is your friend. Uh, one day, a former opposing counsel may refer a very large case to you because you showed poise, patience, detached intelligence, and a calm attitude. And I've had that happen more than once. Uh, the first time, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Let's see if this works. Um, termination versus resignation. If you're lucky enough that your potential client reaches out to you before their separation from employment, I would recommend counseling them to stick around until they're terminated. No resignation or constructive termination case will reap more than an actual adverse 
employment action, which of course the ultimate adverse action is termination. Once the potential client reaches out to the TWC, the Texas Workforce Commission, for unemployment benefits, the employer will be required to give a reason for the separation from employment. Let them paint themselves into a corner. Let them give the reason, and you can either refute it or accept it and then move forward. Either way, you will have that reason in hand, and they're going to be painted into a corner. Uh, moving on from terminations, um, or rather deeper into them, when it comes to terminations, there's no easy way around them. When, whether you're the employer or the employee, there should be a robust paper trail which supports your position. Both parties should have overlapping information regarding counseling, performance reviews, improvement plans, metrics, known duties and responsibilities, and documented reasons for termination. A good general counsel commands the termination of the employee smoothly and quickly. A great general counsel follows up with courtesy copies of any binding restrictive covenants. This will include your non-competes, confidentiality agreements, non-disclosures, etc. Now, naturally, these need to comport with the laws of the state of Texas and should be concomitant with the employee's initial employment agreement. None of these restrictive covenants will be greenlit on the way out the door. That's not going to happen. Any employment law worth their salt will immediately bat that down. Now, if you're being terminated, do not allow yourself to feel rushed. Assign, uh, I'm sorry, to sign anything just because HR and the VP or your manager are in front of you is, is just the worst thing you can do. Always, and, and lastly in that portion, always demand a neutral reference restricted to position and the dates of employment. Um, finally, I constantly remind my potential clients and active clients that Texas is a one-party consent state when it comes to recording conversations in which you are a participant. Surreptitious recordings are 100% good to go in Texas, and if you feel like you're going to go in for a counseling or some type of adverse employment action, which falls in line with some sort of discrimination or retaliation, it may be advisable that that employee record that conversation of which they are a part. Naturally, it's, you know, it sounds um, uh, quite paranoid to assume that every in-office conversation is being recorded, but you don't know that in-office conversations aren't being recorded. And it's not outside the realm of possibility, let's say a company phone uh, would come preloaded with some type of app that would record all the conversations and essentially automatically load them into servers. Uh, some companies uh, are as cautious as government entities. So why not make the assumption that they all are? Um, naturally, of course, the memes are not matching my talking points. These are just something for you all to look at because it's lunch and I'd rather have you all have something to look at besides my mug. Um, people tend to forget that lawyers are essentially wizards. We drink potion, we consult old arcane books, and if we don't say the magic words just right, the case may fall on its face. But magic words also need to come from the employee as well. If the employee or the client doesn't actually submit written complaints to human resources or their supervisors regarding their concerns of possible discrimination or retaliation, of course, any protected reason for that discrimination, prior to their termination or any other adverse employment action, then the whole case devolves into essentially a red light swearing match. The worst thing a potential client can do who has actual legitimate concerns of discrimination or retaliation is not speak up about it until after they're terminated. Notice I said terminated and not after any adverse employment action. Complaining after the fact doesn't play well with juries, and it's the squeaky wheel that will get the grease. Um, I would say check the fine print is always in order, especially in employment law, because what we have to do is look at every scrap of paper that employee has signed, if you're representing the employee. Likewise, anything issued by the employer, if you're representing the company, that requires a signature making sure that either party has signed versions of those documents 
something with a blank signature line, great. That's good as like a, a post-it note. It's essentially what it is. Um, always double check your choice of law provisions, restrictive covenants, the consideration offered in exchange for those uh, restrictive covenants, and of course, the employer's written policies and handbooks, which may not even be attached to the employment agreement. Um, it is no fun filing suit and then learning of a binding arbitration provision, uh, especially when it turns out that the filing fees are actually 50-50 and not 100% on the employer. Um, it, in my opinion, it would be advisable to keep a crib sheet or a cheat sheet with the requisite number of employees that trigger relevant causes of action. You can give these to your staff, but they're actually highly effective in the hands of your referring attorney's staff. Because when these people receive these cases, they can ask a 10 second question stream that says, how many employees were at your, at your place of employment? Uh, how long were you there? Okay. Um, <clears throat> these matter, these questions matter because let's say you have a, a veteran or a minority and they want to bring a uh, cause of action. Well, you only need one employee if you're filing under 1981 or USERA. Well, what if it's Americans with Disabilities or some type, some type of Title VII action? Well, you need 15 employees. Well, what about age discrimination? 20. FMLA? 50. And of course, FMLA, you need to have a calendar year of employment with at least 1,250 hours actually executed during that employment. Does it need to be all in one block? No, not necessarily. Um, if referring attorneys and their staff can have this cheat sheet, they will sift out half of the non-starter cases for you. There is nothing worse than getting a referral and getting all excited and you know, setting the time aside to interview the potential uh, client only to realize that they had seven coworkers and there is no Title VII cause of action, or only to realize that they may have had an FMLA cause of action, but they were only there for 10 months instead of 12, or they were there for 12 months, but they didn't complete the 1,250 hours of work. Um, requisites to a good lawsuit. I have seen a lot of lawsuits a lot of pleadings from opposing. Um, and when I clerked for the 133rd Civil District Court, I read a lot of intake. I think it was Judge Lamar McCorkle had me brief the dockets constantly, um, up and down, always looking for anything I had to research, any case law, anything substantive. Um, some of them are great. Some of them I wouldn't use as scratch paper. Um, when it comes to employment law, your original complaint should always contain a section dedicated to the exhaustion of administrative remedies. Okay, That's either going to be Title VII with the EEOC or Chapter 21 of the Texas Labor Code with the TWC. If there is no administrative remedy, like with 1981, put that language in there. Make it very clear that it's, it's wrote and accepted case law that your client at no time needed to file with any administrative agency and that they're well within the statute of limitations for those particular causes of action. There should be a, there should also be a portion dedicated to arguing about pretext. Naturally, once your client, let's say you're representing the employee, has alleged discrimination, then the employer says, well, there wasn't actually discrimination we had a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for the adverse action, okay? And that adverse action can be a demotion, failure to promote, a lateral promotion that's actually more burdensome on the, on the employee. It messes with their hours. It makes it more difficult for them to pick up their children from daycare. It restricts their geographic scope where they otherwise would have had a good, uh, bountiful harvest for, let's say, a uh, realtor then they're placed in a different neighborhood, but it's not really selling so hot. Um, all of those items are adverse employment actions, but they can only be measured by how they affect the employee's bottom line. So ultimately, but apart from termination, you have to measure everything by that. So once the employer says, well, we had a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for this action, 
Well, then you need to turn around and say, no, but no, no, you didn't. That's pretext. That's manufactured. It's never happened before. It hasn't happened since. And, you know, X, Y, and Z. You need to be able to turn around and, and you know, any, any good attorney is going to have um, some kind of pretext language in their lawsuit that basically alleges that whether it's bolstering after the fact, failure to retain evidence, uh, manufacturing of documents, uh, testimony only from interested parties, those are all pretextual items. That will help you fight a summary judgment, but you need to lay that down in your original pleadings. If you can make the case and lay the foundation in your original complaint, it will be so easy to have that hook so that as you establish the case, as you go through discovery, as you take depositions, and as you send off your request for admission, request for production and interrogatories, you can keep hooking back to that pretext. You can keep that in your mind so that once you respond to the summary judgment, you can say, uh, Your Honor, we've established the pretext. The pretext destroys or at least overturns any summary judgment that's on the way. And we've established that through the production, through our discovery. And by the way, let me go ahead and cite this entire deposition just for your pleasure. Um, beyond that, I would say be hyper-specific with your fact portions in your original complaint. Uh, I require that my clients submit a detailed deadline, uh, I'm sorry, a detailed timeline of the factual allegations that I can essentially copy and paste. And that will go at first into a demand letter slash litigation hold. And after that, I can move that into the guts of a lawsuit like that. And beyond that point, it also covers your back because during the deposition or during some portion of discovery, they're going to ask the client if they ever saw your lawsuit. And nothing will make you sweat more as a plaintiff's counsel than when you're in a deposition and your client has your work in front of them. And they're going to say, have you seen this before? And your client will say yes. And they'll say, well, how have you seen it? And they'll say, I greenlit the timeline for my lawyer so he could file it or she could file it. You want your clients to have as much grasp of the facts as you do. And the two of you need to walk into that deposition in lockstep. At no point should they be looking to you for counsel. They should wait for you to object or not object, but they should have command of the facts more than you do, if not as much. Um, there's nothing worse than an instrument in any pleading that's carefully crafted and submitted to the court that doesn't tell your client's entire story, especially not the way you need it to. Remember, before the judge even looks at a submission, a clerk is the beta reader, and the judge usually asks them for the quick rundown. They just, they want that 15 second version from the clerk. Make it easy on the clerk. Um, beat the clock. Develop a schedule or a countdown clock for every case that you have. As your practice continues, oh, sorry about the names. There you go. As your practice continues to develop, you need to create a framework that'll help keep you on track and avoid misdates and filing deadlines. Uh, the, that's, that's the high octane fuel of grievances and malpractice claims right there. This clock needs to start the minute you wrap your brain around the case and goes back 180 days if it's a Texas Workforce Commission claim or 300 days if there's an EEOC claim from the date of filing with that agency. This clock should reactivate when you receive a statutory notice of right to sue from either of these entities, allowing for 60 days for the TWC, or 90 days for the EEOC within which you have the right to file suit. It reactivates again after you file with the deadline to perfect service. It reactivates once the judge sends out an internal order for a conference and a joint discovery case management plan prior to the Rule 26 scheduling order, which if you miss either of those, your rear is going to be in a sling for a minute. Um, again, the clock reactivates with discovery because even though you may have four to nine months to make something happen, it doesn't mean that you have forever. And you'll find that that clock can run out faster than you can imagine, especially when you're dealing with multiple cases. Um, in my experience, at least one round of requests from both sides should conclude before any deposition takes place. Um, at least two rounds, if necessary, should conclude before the close of discovery. And any final requests obviously need to be sent out well in advance of the 30-day deadline. 
Now, while you may know that, your staff may not, but they'll learn and write quick. In fact, your staff's ability to keep in command time in this aspect of your cases is vital. You may rule the galaxy, but they run the solar systems within it. And without their attentive oversight, suns start blinking out and then planets die off, and that's bad. <clears throat> um, never reinvent the wheel. One of the best things your online research will ever yield should be CLE written on the very topic you're litigating, especially when it was authored by opposing counsel themselves. Uh, second to that, it's easy to go into any PACER or district clerk search engine and raid the complaints previously filed by legal titans, whether they are friend or foe. I can't tell you the number of times I have had a case where, thankfully, uh, my opposing publishes and publishes a lot. My first six figure um, heavy hitter settlement was against a absolute legal titan. Um, I think she was out of Boston. And when I figured out who she was, I read everything of hers I could get my hands on. And I was able to crawl into her brain before we even spoke settlement. And I knew exactly how she was going to move. And I was able to pull out the wing. I was a second year lawyer. And here, this, this individual, she had been board certified since the year I was born, which if anyone is curious is 1984. Um, judge's orders. At the outset of every federal case, and have no doubt that any competent general counsel or defense counsel will remove a case to the federal district courts if the opportunity presents itself, um, the judge will likely dole out their own internal procedures, especially in employment law cases where the parties are expected to essentially engage in front-loaded discovery before the onset of the actual discovery phase. Um, judge, I think it's Justice Hoyt and Justice Rosenthal, they request a wealth of information to be exchanged between the parties before counsel even appears for the initial scheduling conference. Uh, to that end, Smart Plaintiffs Counsel collects a host of information and documents from the clients at the outset of litigation. And a wise attorney has a copy of the judge's in-house procedures and rules attached firmly to their relevant case files. It would be advisable that once an attorney knows which judge the case has landed in front of, consult the local rules and then saddle the client with deadlines to produce any requested materials or answer any vital questions. Oftentimes, the judges will put out their own um, initial disclosures, which require information that the client may only know. And to that end, the judges want those responses pretty quick. And I know for a fact, Justice Hoyt and Justice Rosenthal, they do not brook sandbagging. Um, judge, I think Justice Hanks is pretty flexible. Um, judge Bray. Um, the list goes on, but the more experience you have, the more you'll get a handle on what the judges will and will not tolerate and whether you can get away with an excuse or not. Um, let's see. When you saddle your client with preparing responses to the judge's orders, you essentially do two things. First, it shows the client that you're on the ball and it gives them a timeline of performance that they can expect to see. That relieves the burden on them trying to prompt you all the time about, can I get an update? When is this going to happen? When is that going to happen? The sooner you can lay out a timeline expectation for your client, the, the less they'll be apt to keep bugging you about updates, which personally I can't stand. Um, this gets them in the game and it keeps them attentive as opposed to checked out and forgetful. Second, if there are any screw-ups, the attorney has an email trail to their client begging them for information and expressing the urgency with which they comply with the judge's demands. If there are any issues, the judge will be lenient with you and browbeat the non-compliant parties. It's beyond vital that you follow these orders and the judge's protocols and any complaint procedures as well in order to keep the court happy and on your side. The last thing you want to do is rustle the judge's jimmies when they have these rules in place for a good reason. And that brings me to my last portion 
and hopefully I'll have some time for questions. Um, you have to run the numbers. Administrative agencies and service of process are vital to the survival of your case. Do you have to develop a formula that details each type and series of case you handle in employment law. And you need to teach this to your staff thoroughly. EEOC claims, of course, must be filed within 300 days from the date of incident about which you wish to file suit. Contrapositively, the Texas Workforce Commission must be in 180 days. More importantly, these operational timeframes don't prohibit you from referencing a pattern of behavior by the at-fault party, which extends back further than those temporal constraints. So while it may not support a cause of action on its own, those factual references beyond 180 or 300 days will support a story that you can present to a judge and jury, which will lay the foundations for the incidents which did occur within those times and which do support a legitimate cause of action. A lot of people say, don't leave money on the table. I'm of the disposition that you don't leave facts on the table. You gather up as many facts as you can, as hyper-specifically as possible. Um, after you or the client receive a statutory notice of right to sue, of course, you have 60 days for the PwC and 90 days for the EEOC, which one you can file. There is a measure of flexibility. I do not recommend that you test it. Of course, you, after you file, you have another 90 days which in, within which you can perfect service of process. If you don't already have a habit of filing an issuance of summons and emailing your process server a certified copy of the summons and original complaint, develop one now. Create a, a prefabricated timetable that will allow for you to put all the, all the moving parts above in your process server's hands immediately. That way, if your service is untimely, late, or fails, you can attach those emails to any response to a motion to dismiss or failure to perfect service and give the court a reason to exercise its discretion and prudence in pushing the case forward. Now, that brings us to statutes of limitation and, of course, the requisite number of employees. Again, a cheat sheet will save your bacon. You'll, you will spare yourself more time than you can imagine you have someone else filter a case for concerns that would necessarily knock it out. Employment law cases have a variety of statutes of limitations, and requisite number of employees that are as different as the seasons, yet may serve the same purpose. A good example is Chapter 21 of the Texas Labor Code and Title VII both require 15 or more employees and both address discrimination and retaliation based upon race. They're both limited by temporal constraints listed above and require clearance through some type of administrative agency, the EEOC or the PwC. They also share a tiered damage model that limits out at $300,000, which only focuses on the employing entity. Now, in contrast, under 42 USC 1981, it also addresses racial discrimination and retaliation, but only requires one employee, has a four-year statute of limitations, and requires no administrative agency to approve filing the suit. Moreover, there is no damage cap under 1981, and it allows for individual causes of action against managers and supervisors who engaged in the conduct at issue. Night and day, same, same thing. They serve the same purpose, but they are night and day apart. These are items that you need to have rattling around in your head constantly, where you may have an ADA claim that will fail your FMLA claim may survive based on the statute of limitations. Again, going back to the numbers, Americans with disabilities or pregnancy discrimination require 15 employees, but the Age Discrimination Act under the ADEA or the Older Workers Benefits Protection Act requires 20 employees. FMLA needs 50. Warren Act cases need 100. Um, I would say once you develop a catalog of your causes of action and your number of employees and you memorize it and you give it out to your staff and you give it out to your referring attorney staff, you should be good to go. Lastly, and this just came up, I think about five minutes before the presentation, um, save all of your research. You absolutely have to save, copy and paste, whatever it is. The research you conducted on cases ages ago 
will pop up in arguments and motions and responses that you will see in the future. A week, a month, a year from now, you will be faced with the carbon copy of the 12B6 motion that you had to deal with before. And with any luck, you'll be able to copy and paste about 90% of your arguments, case law, and argumentative language. Nothing beats putting together a four-hour response in an hour and a half. And of course, still building for those four hours. Um, let's see. I think that I think that does it for my memes and my presentation. Um, did anyone have any questions? No, should I keep going with the memes? Yeah, please do. Um, just just a, a plug if anyone has questions or if Julian, you would be willing to share your contact information if nobody's brave enough to. Absolutely. Oh, sorry, we might have a question. Uh, please. Um, so for, I'm just going to read it to you because it might be easier. From EEOC, uh, the 180 calendar day filing deadline is extended to 300 calendar days. If a state or local agency enforces a law that prohibits employment discrimination on the same basis, does this mean that as long as they state TWC on their charge, then they have 300 days under TWC in which to file? Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, what I always like to do is, and, and I don't know if anyone else does this, this may just be me being paranoid. I like to get a letter of reciprocity so if I go through the TWC, I will email the EEOC and say, will you give me a letter of reciprocity so I can mirror this in a federal cause of action? Or um, I'll, I'll go upstream and approach the EEOC, uh, I'm sorry, approach the TWC with my EEOC right to sue. Um, this may be paranoid of me, but I would rather have verification and some type of paper trail than not. Does anyone else have any questions? Please feel free to post them in the Q and A, and we can put them live to Julian. And if you like, I can I can post up. Um, let me see if I have pictures of my cows in here. Um, how do I do this? Yeah, share screen. I'll just I'll just rotate through some some memes here. Um, can I ask a question? Just uh, oh no, wait, never mind. Uh, somebody has oh someone was just saying that they really enjoyed it. Um, I was going to say if um any of our attendees are perhaps you know, new to their practice and they're considering employment um, law as, a, as an area, is there anything kind of you would like them to know or, you know, the, it's a, is there are good, good and bad things about it just generally? You have to kind of have a flavor for it. Um, um, I'll give you the, the brief rundown. When I was a paralegal before I went to law school, I, I was at uh, let's see, Zimmerman Axelrad uh, for a while. Um, I was at Fitz Zell. Um, and then I worked for uh, Glenn Patterson over in Greenway Plaza, who uh, now I think he does arbitration and mediation. Um, at the time, he was in employment law and he was the best boss I ever had. He sat me down and he said, Julian, you're going to interview the clients. You're going to talk to the EOC and the TWC. You're going to craft everything that goes to the court. You're going to submit all the motions. You're going to file everything. And I'm going to sit in my chair and I'm going to say yes or no. And it kind of instilled in me the desire to go into employment law. I have a sister who's an attorney and she manages other attorneys for a document review for quite a large firm. Uh, my father is an attorney. He's been practicing for 30 years. We have nothing in common. My dad does personal injury. Um, my sister, like I said, she 
herds cats for a living. Um, but um, it's it's interesting because we can still talk to each other and bounce these cases around. And it's it's nice to have those different aspects where they can you can get some advice and, and kind of bounce the ball back a little bit. Um, that being said, I totally forgot what I was just talking about. So yeah, lost my train of thought. Well, thank you so much. Um, if no one else has any questions, um, I've put Julian's contact information in the chat so you can um, reach out to him if you have questions directly. Um, again, this presentation, although it will not qualify for CLE, uh, if you rewatch it on YouTube, it will be on our Hilo YouTube channel. Um, so if you missed anything uh, or just want to relive uh, the last hour, um, then you know please go and do that. Um, but I think at this point, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Julian, for uh, attending our presentation today. And I hope everyone enjoyed it. My genuine pleasure. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. <laughs>